Live from Toronto, Canada, The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrin from Zuma Radio, AM 740. And welcome to the Audio Imaginarium. Come on in, weary traveler. Hang your cloak on a peg, grab a stool, and come gather around the fire. There are stories to be told, and you are among friends. Now, before we get rolling, a big thanks A big thanks to our Star Chamber patrons, Deep Paul and Tim Sullivan. Deep Paul and Tim Sullivan, I truly appreciate your support. And um, I can't uh, I can't thank you enough from my heart. Thank you so much, Deep Paul and Tim Sullivan. Now, if you want to support the work we do here, please consider becoming an official donor at Patreon.com slash Strange Planet. Patreon.com slash strange planet 30 years after his dramatic feature jfk and countless interviews you might have thought legendary film director oliver stone had said pretty much everything he had to say about the kennedy assassination but not so now comes jfk revisited through the looking glass it's a two-hour documentary film based on the 1992 non-fiction book destiny betrayed jfk cuba and the Garrison case by Jim DiEugenio, a frequent guest in this program, although it's been a while. And uh, the film, the documentary film, also based on newly declassified evidence about the case. And Through the Looking Glass premiered on July 12th of this year at the Con uh, premiere section of the 2021 Con Film Festival. And Jim DiEugenio, one of the world's foremost assassination researchers, of course, wrote the script and he's standing by to talk about the new film. Again, JFK revisited through the looking glass. Coming up in hour two, Mike Lancaster was barely a teenager when he was asked to join the Merry Pranksters, a collection of comrades and followers of American author Ken Kesey back in 1964. Kesey and the Merry Pranksters lived communally uh, at Kesey's home in California and Oregon and are noted for the uh, the sociological significance of this lengthy road trip they took in the summer of 1964, traveling across the United States in a psychedelic painted school bus called Further, organizing parties and giving out LSD. And Mike will be here to tell us about a, a few of his many adventures in the 1960s, but he's here also to talk about the health benefits of something called structured water, structured water. Carlos Kajina is the technical producer. Ryan White is the live stream producer. And we are live streaming on my YouTube channel tonight, Strange Planet. Don't forget to head hit the uh, red sub button while you're there. Jim D. Eugenio wrote the script for Oliver Stone's new documentary film, Through the Looking Glass. Jim is the author of Destiny Betrayed, about the garrison investigation of the Kennedy assassination, first published in 92 with a second greatly revised edition issued in 2012, and Reclaiming Parkland, published in 2013, reprinted in expanded form in 2016, and then reissued with additional material in 2018 as the JFK assassination, The Evidence Today, which offers a detailed critical examination of the Warren Commission's evidence and conclusions as presented presented by Vincent Bugliosi's Reclaiming History, along with an analysis of the CIA's influence in Hollywood. He's also co-author, <clears throat> co-author and editor of the Assassination, Assassinations Probe magazine on JFK, MLK, RFK, and Malcolm X. He co-edited Probe magazine from 1993 to 2000 and was a guest commentator on the anniversary issue of the film JFK, re-released by Warner Brothers in 2013. Jim D. Eugenio, welcome back. How are you, my friend? Nice, nice to be back, Richard. I, I'd like to make one correction. All right, and um, this is not this is wrong at IMDb, and it's wrong at Wikipedia, and I'm still trying to figure out how it got this way. All right, the uh, the the film JFK Through the Looking Glass is not really based on Destiny Betrayed. It's an original screenplay. Ah, okay. And when 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 you see the film, it will just say written by James D. Eugenio. The, the film that's out now is a two-hour version that was shown at the Cannes Film Festival. 
And that's what's selling all over Europe. Okay, it's sell, sold in several countries like Italy, France, and Spain, you know, so far in Europe and the three or four other places. They expect a UK sale pretty soon. All right. The long version of the movie, which is four hours, okay, that will be called Destiny Betrayed, okay? But that still will not be based on the book. That's an original screenplay also. Oliver just liked that title, okay? And so that's why he put it on to the longer version, okay? As, as good as the short version is, I can tell you that the long version is, is going to be magisterial. Okay. So do you want me to explain how this got started? Yeah, I'd like to talk to you. I'd, I'd like to hear from you about how, how you got together with Oliver Stone and, and, um, and how you became the, the, uh, the script writer for this. This is a, a major, major accomplishment, Jim. Okay, th th this is what happened. In 2013, the 50th anniversary of Kennedy's assassination, if you remember what a pig out that was, okay? Um, Tom Hanks and uh, Vincent Bugliosi and Tom Brokaw and how they cordoned off Dealey Plaza. And it was just terrible, okay? You didn't have hardly any dissident views got through. And so Oliver and Zach Sklar, who did the screenplay for JFK, were attacked in the Chicago Tribune. Okay, I can't remember who the writer was right now. Um, and so they replied, and Oliver sent me the reply and asked me what I thought of it. Okay, and, and so I said, well, it's not bad, but I don't think you guys are aware of all the new evidence that's been declassified by the Assassinations Record Review Board. All right, and so Oliver, being the curious guy that he was, okay, and is, he said, can you send me some of this stuff? And so I sent him and Zach about a two-page memo of all the new evidence that the review board declassified, all right? And so then about two or three years, two or three years later, he did the introduction for the revision of my book called The JFK Assassination the evidence today. And I went down to his office, okay, to give him some input on that. And again, we started talking about all of this new evidence that the review board had declassified, but yet America hadn't seen. There'd been a permission blackout, all right? Even though the assassinations record review board was caused by him. Right. Right. <laughs> right. But if, if your listeners don't understand what that means, when JFK came out in 1991, it created such a sensation. Okay. I mean, if you weren't around, it, it was really something to behold. Okay. And so at the end of the movie, Oliver put a trailer on it, a, a moving title saying that the files of the House Select Committee on Assassinations are classified until the year 2029. And so a lot of people didn't know this. And so they began sending in faxes and, and telegrams and phone calls, et cetera, all right? And it managed to actually create this whole new body of the government, an extraordinary uh, five-person team, whose job it was to declassify the rest of the documents that were still, and it was, they declassified it 2 million pages, all right, in about four years, from 1994 to 1998. The problem was that the media hardly even knew that they were around, and they didn't publicize any of the discoveries. So when me and Oliver started talking about this, okay, these discussions went on and off for a while, and he got together with his friend and producer, Rob Wilson, and they decided, you know something, why don't we do something over this, okay? You know, why don't we do a counterpunch to what happened in 2013, you know, through these 
all these new documents and all this new information. So after a few discussions, we decided to go ahead and do it. And they had me be the writer because, you know, because I, I knew this stuff. I'm one of like five people in America who kept up on this stuff, right. you know. And Rob became the producer and Oliver was the director. And so that's how the project got started. All right. And then we went through about six different drafts of the script. Okay. Oliver's, you know, Oliver does as much work on his documentaries as he does on his feature films. He's very much a hands on type of guy. Right. Okay. Is he easy to work with? So, what? Is he easy to work with? Yeah. Well, I found him to be fairly easy to work with. I didn't have any major problems with Oliver. Okay. Throughout. I mean, because see, he's such a hands on guy, you know, even in the editing process. Okay. Uh, you know, every once in a while you'll have a disagreement, but about 90% of the time, 95% of the time, everything was fine. I didn't have any problems with him. All right. And he just gave, I understood what I was supposed to be doing. Okay. He's the director. Okay. I'm the writer. Okay. And so I understood what I was supposed to be doing. I was doing my best to carry out what he wanted done. Okay. And so we would go over to his house and we would have like a two hour discussion of the latest draft of the, of the script. I would, you know, they, in Hollywood parlance, you would take your notes down. Okay. And I would go home and I would revise the script. And this went through five or six different drafts. All right. And I tried to put as much of the new evidence as I could into there. Okay. In other words, the stuff that came out 2017, right? Well, no, it came out from 1994 to 1998. But then what happened? Then what happened? See, the review board didn't last long enough to get everything out. So they put on a lot of these memos and a lot of this information, they put on what they called a phased declassification program. They put a year on it. Okay, we're going to let this go in 2001. Right. We're going to let this go in 2002. We're going to let this go in 2003. And there, a lot of it was that way. But since I know a lot of people who work on this case, I was made aware of these things that would be passed around. All right. And because of my website, kennedysandking.com, you know, we, we put a lot of this stuff up there. You know, we're like one of the very few that do that. And so I was made aware of this stuff. Okay. So I, I knew what the breaking stuff really was. So then it became, once I had the script down, then it became a matter of getting all the people that we would need, okay, to, to get this information out there. And we, I think on my original list, I had something like 35 people, okay? And we got something we had a really remarkable batting average, you know, between, I think we got 29 or 30 of them. There were some of the people because it dragged on, the shooting process dragged on into the early COVID thing. Okay. And uh, so we, there were some people who didn't want to travel. Okay. You know, and so, but we got most of the people that we wanted. And some well, people who are some of the top the top people that we're going to see in the in the film, Jim, the, the, on your list, the top okay. people on your list. Some some of the people that we got that I think did very well uh, and really helped us were David Talbot, the author of The Devil's Chessboard and Brothers, the founder of Salon Magazine. He was so good that even the technical guys on the set. God, Jim, is the next guy going to be that good? You know, these, are, these are the sound man and the, and the uh, cameraman, you know, and the gaffer, et cetera. Okay. So he was very important. Okay. John Newman, uh, a historian of James Madison, who wrote JFK in Vietnam and Oswald in the CIA. He was very important. He actually did two interviews with us. Okay. Uh, one on JFK and Vietnam and one on Oswald. All right. 
Uh, we had Jefferson Morley, uh, who's done a lot of work on the George Joannidis, uh, the guy who was kept secret from the House Select Committee, who was working for the CIA in 1963 with the DRE. Right? Uh, we have Lisa Peace, who did a lot of in, uh, good work on Indonesia. Okay, uh, and the whole, see the film is is really two films. There's one part is about the forensic evidence, and that's where we use people like Cyril Wecht, the famous pathologist from Pittsburgh, right. Gary Aguilar, okay, out in San Francisco, another medical doctor who's done a lot of good work, David Mantic, who we flew in from Palm Springs, okay, he's very good. Uh, Mike Chesser, who's a neurologist from uh, Little Rock, Arkansas, we flew him in. Okay, and and those are the kind of, those are the forensic kind of people we used, but we also did a historical angle to it, and we used the best scholars on the Kennedy presidency, you know, that we could find. People like Robert Rocco from Stanford, people like Philip Muhlenbeck from uh, George Washington. All right, and 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 so we wanted to keep people. Uh, and and Bradley, um, oh God, what's his name? Um, he wrote a great book about the Indonesia overthrow called Economists with Guns. Okay, Brad Simpson from the University of Connecticut. Okay, and so was, see what we were trying to show is that right after Kennedy's death, a lot of changes took place. Okay, that Kennedy had installed and was trying to work on during this presidency. Now, in the long version, when the long version comes out, you'll see how we show how Kennedy evolved into that kind of a character, the kind of a person that, you know, that essentially threw down the gauntlet to Eisenhower, John, John Foster Dulles in 1957 with his great Algeria speech, okay, which created a sensation, you know, when, when he made that speech on the floor of the Senate back in the summer of 1957, saying the United States has to get out of Algeria. We shouldn't be supporting the French. The French Empire just fell in Vietnam, and it's going to fall here. We want to be on the right side of history, okay? And uh, the guy who promoted the ugly American he bought 100 copies of that book, sent them to all the fellow senators, paid for an ad with his own money in the New York Times. Then when he became president, he helped get the film made. The State Department didn't want to have it made, but Kennedy helped push it through. See, that Kennedy, that angle of Kennedy, uh, we're, we're going to put in there. It's in there now, but it will be able to be in there in a longer take, okay, in the four-hour version. And so that's what we were trying to show. Any All witnesses do you have? I mean, you're in a race. Obviously, this is, you know, f we're talking now 58 well, years. Donald Sutherland is one of the narrators. Ah, Donald fantastic. Donald Sutherland is one of the narrators. Okay. And, and of course, he was played Mr. X. Fletcher Prouty. Fletcher Prouty. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. He, who was disguised as Fletcher Prouty. And then we have Whoopi Goldberg. Uh, sh she does the forensic part. Sutherland does the historical part. Okay. Right. And we got, if you can believe, I still can't believe we did this. We got, if any of your listeners there are film aficionados, we got Robert Richardson to shoot the movie for us. This guy's won three Oscars. One for JFK, okay, one for uh, Hugo, and one for The Aviator. Fantastic. All right, so what you have here, <laughs> and it really, I mean, to, to make, to really... When you really think about this, Oliver Stone, three Oscars. Robert Richardson, three Oscars. Whoopi Goldberg, Whoopi Goldberg, one Oscar. Donald Sutherland, an Emmy and an honorary Oscar. Now, I know there has never been a JFK film like this before, a documentary, not like that. And in my honest opinion, and I'm somewhat of a film aficionado, I've never heard of a documentary 
with that kind of star power to it. Oh, it's got the gravitas yeah. is incredible. I mean, I mean, Jim, you must be in a way pinching yourself because I mean, you've been obviously your your uh, your work now is going to be up there on the big screen. This is do you feel like this is the culmination for you of all of your years of work? And well, in a way, yes, I do. Okay, you know, I, it's it's really nice that finally, okay, the a lot of the world as we know it is finally going to be exposed to a lot of these new developments in the JFK case, which I've been one of the only people, you know, trying exactly. to get this stuff out there. Okay. You know, and so yes, it's 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 very nice and and I really do hope, you know, that a lot of people understand now, you know, what I've been trying to do with Kennedy's and King, okay, and 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 my books, and you know, in in the long run, I think it I think it eventually will get to the United States and Canada, okay, you know. So that Jim, that's I got to jump in. Pardon the interruption. We're going to take a quick timeout. We'll come back. Jim D. Eugenio wrote the uh, the script for JFK Revisited Through the Looking Glass, a two-hour documentary just premiered at the uh, Cannes Film Festival. And there will be a four-hour version coming out. Can't wait to see it. Back with more of The Conspiracy Show. Stay with us. This is no place for the naive or the faint-hearted. The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett from Zoomer Radio. No, I was told... Here's a resolution for 2021. Reduce stress and enhance your immune system. ESS60 from C60 Evo. C60 is the carbon 60 molecule known to deliver more than 172 times the power of vitamin C, 172 times. ESS60 is the purest form of C60, a known antiviral, antibacterial, and anti-inflammatory remedy that works. ESS60 neutralizes free radicals from cell metabolization and external toxins to help minimize inflammation and maximize detoxification. Further, people report better sleep, more energy, and renewed mental clarity when they take our ESS60 organic oil. To order your miracle molecule ESS60, go to c60evo.com slash Richard hyphen Serrett. c60evo.com slash Richard hyphen Serrett. Buy now and save 10% by using the coupon code EVRS at checkout. Again, use the coupon code E V R S at checkout. Daily Grand Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett from Zoomer Radio. And we are back with Jim D. Eugenio. And the documentary film is JFK Revisited Through the Looking Glass. So what are some of the um, the things that we're going to see in the the two hour um, uh, documentary, Jim? Are we going to are we going to hear anything about the latest, let's say, uh, revelations that came out 2017? Well, what what we did in the in, in the film is we concentrated on this these the so-called core evidence in the case. The trailer that's out there now, okay, by Altitude, which is a distribution company. Right, I saw it tonight. Okay, concentrates on CE399. Mm. That, I think it's two minutes and 12 seconds long. That is only the beginning of us. See, one of my goals here in the film was to show that in a normal court case, CE399 would never be admitted. Okay, CE399, of course, is the magic bullet. Right, right. Okay, it would never be admitted into a court of law simply because, and we got Henry Lee, by the way, I didn't name him. Henry Lee is in the film also. And he has a wonderful vignette. I didn't know, he used to be a captain in a Taiwan police force before he came to the United States. So when I met him at a Malibu, 
Okay, because he wanted to see the questions we were going to ask him. I said, well, then you ran a lot of investigations. And he goes, yes, I did. And I said, well, then you should talk about chain of custody for us. Okay. And so he did. And so this is, and, and he does it so beautifully. He goes, he, the chain of custody begins at the scene of the crime. It goes to the police station. It goes to the lab. And then it ends up in court. And if those are not certified, if you cannot put somebody's initials in a day and a time, then you're going to have some problems when it comes to court. Now, of course, the chain of custody in CE399 doesn't exist. There is no chain. That's one of the things we really, really went into in CE399. CE399. Right. This we is the bullet, the bullet that, that caused uh, eight injuries between seven. JFK, or seven injuries, and Connolly. JFK caused two, went through Conley, both right. his chest, his uh, right wrist, and his left thigh. And then this, ends up on a gurney in a hospital in pristine condition, the bullet. The wrong gurney. Right. It's the wrong gurney. All right. And so we're going to show this, how this would never be admitted into a court of law. There simply is no chain of custody on it. And in fact... In fact, let me let me give you a little preview. This this bullet was supposed to have arrived at the FBI lab at 7:30 p.m. Okay. Well, there's a very serious problem with this because the bullet was supposed to have been given to the FBI agent by the Secret Service at 8:45. PM. <laughs> That's so a slight my... problem. Yeah. <laughs> Just a slight. How did they get to the FBI lab when the guy, the FBI didn't, didn't have it yet? Okay. <laughs> right, right. And so what happened, of course, is the FBI lied about this. They said that Elmer Lee Todd's initials, the guy who got the FBI, the guy in the FBI who got the bullet from the Secret Service at the White House at 845, they said his initials are on the bullet. Well, guess what? And I'm sure it's not going to be surprising to you, Richard. Elmer Lee Todd's initials are not on the bullet. So mm -hmm. somebody pulled a big fibber on that one. Okay? Right. Something happened there. And and for those that not not overly familiar with uh, CE three nine nine, the magic yeah, bullet. See, see, this is what we were trying. This is what I wanted to do with CE three nine nine. Right. What I wanted to do was to pull it out of the whole m morass of these this trajectory argument. Okay, I wanted I I wanted to get rid of that. I I said, look, arguing whether or not CE three nine nine could do all those things is like a cat chasing its tail. Because CE-399 never existed that day. It didn't exist in Dealey Plaza. It wasn't fired in Dealey Plaza. It was planted. And the question is, who planted it? Who planted it on the wrong gurney? Right. Okay? And that's how you begin to find out of who was involved in this case. So that's one of the things. I'm giving you a little preview you know, of, of, what, we, of what we did in the film. You know? And and like Dave Mantic said, which I, you saw the trailer, right? Yes, I did. I saw the trailer. Dave Mantic said, the, the problem is CE399 is foundational. Right. To right. both the Warren Commission and the House Select Committee. When yeah. in fact, you can't have a real investigation of the Kennedy case if you think CE399 is real, because it's not. And without CE399, right. without it, uh, I mean, that, that, as you say, it's foundational because unless you have that one bullet responsible for seven wounds, then you have to have more than the three shots fired, right? You're, that's exactly correct. And if you have more than three shots fired, that means conspiracy. That means conspiracy. Right. Then you've got conspiracy. All right. So that's one of the things we did. Now, we had Doug Horn. I don't know if you know who he is. No, no. 
he was on the uh, the Assassinations Record Review Board. He did a lot of the medical investigation. He's on the program, all right? And he talks a lot about the autopsy that night. I'm sure you're aware of all the many problems that the JFK autopsy poses. Okay, first of all, why were there 40 guys there in the gallery that night? You know, what did you need all those people from the military there all that night? You know, why were they there? Okay, and one of the things they were there for, of course, was to limit the autopsy. There's, there was no back wound dissection of Kennedy's, and by the way, that's the magic bullet. Okay, that's the bullet. The bullet went through Kennedy's back and allegedly went through his throat is the right. magic. That was never dissected. You know, dissection means that you track the bullet through the body to see which direction it came from and where it exited at. Well, in my opinion, these guys knew there was no track through the body. And so that's why the doctors were not allowed to dissect that wound. But even better, we have. Doug Horn, who was in the room when the chief counsel of the review board cross-examined John Stringer. John Stringer is supposed to be the official photographer for the Kennedy autopsy. All right. And Doug was right in the room when Jeremy Gunn cross-examined him. And so he ran him through some questions about, oh, you were there that night. You took all the pictures, et cetera. Why don't we walk over here? And we're going to show you some of the pictures that are attributed to you of Kennedy's brain. Okay. So walks him over to this photo stand, shows him some of the pictures. And Horn, who was right there, said, Stringer got up from his seat. He walked over to the picture stand. You know, kind of excited. And he said, this is Ansco, referring to the kind of film it was. I didn't use Ansco. Oh. Use okay. Then he points at the numbers at the bottom. There's a series of numbers at the bottom of the, of the, of the film print. And he says, you see these numbers? This means this was done with a press pack. I didn't use press pack. And he, then Jeremy Gunn then asked him, he said, well, you see how in these pictures, the cerebellum is intact. That's the back of the brain near the bottom. He says, yes. He goes, you didn't, you didn't recall that, did you? You thought the cerebellum was blasted. And he goes, yes, that's what I recall. And so then Jeremy Gunn asked him, are you ready to deny that you took these pictures? And he goes, as far as I know, I didn't take these pictures. <laughs> Holy smokes. What, so, what, happened, to, what happened to his pictures then? Thing which would never be admitted into a court of law. Because if you're going to put in an illustration or a photograph, it has to be testified to by the person who either did the drawing or took the picture. So these brain photographs would never be admitted into a court of law. So the question then becomes, obviously, if you're running a real investigation, which nobody was, okay, who took these pictures? And why did they have to take another set of pictures? Why? And so that's one of the questions that we asked. If you can believe it, okay, <laughs> we were the first person to ask this question. Why did there have to be another set of pictures? Jim, we've got to take and, another time out. We'll, uh, we'll like pick it up on the other Apple. side. And Michael, Michael Chesser is a neurologist. Okay, uh, okay. Jim, i got to take a time out, so we'll come back on the other side. Jim DiEugenio mm -hmm. is with us, and the new documentary film is JFK Revisited Through the Looking Glass, directed by Oliver Stone, script by Jim DiEugenio. Back with more of our conversation in mere moments. Stay with us.
Hey there, I'm hard at work on another edition of Inner Sanctum, my free monthly newsletter. Inner Sanctum features my monthly brief, a column of my thoughts and opinions on what's happening in the world. It features a spotlight on a past guest, a look ahead to an upcoming episode of my weekly syndicated radio program, The Conspiracy Show. It features a look at this month in conspiracy and UFO history and my Conspiracy Unlimited podcast episode pick of the month and so much more. To get your free monthly newsletter, Inner Sanctum, delivered to your email inbox, just go to my website, strangeplanet.ca, strangeplanet.ca. Scroll down to the bottom of the page and click on Inner Sanctum and register. It's fast, easy, and again, absolutely free. This is no place for the naive or the faint-hearted. The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett from Zoomer Radio. Aha! What if one bullet made all seven wounds? Arlen Specter, he is the one that gave birth to the single bullet theory. What if one bullet went into Kennedy's back and came out his neck and then went into Connolly's back, uh, piercing the lung, destroying four inches of the right fifth rib, exiting from the front of his chest, going into the back of the wrist, shattering the distal end of the radius, and a six foot four guy like Connolly, that's a big heavy bone, comminuted fracture, exits from the front of the wrist, goes into his left thigh. Whatever you want, whatever you need, this bullet happily and readily obliges you. It is indeed a magic bullet. There you go, that's Cyril Wecht. What is he now, 90, 90 years old, uh, Jim? Still pretty sharp. Yes, yes, yeah, he's he's very good at elucidating all the trickery that went into the single bullet theory. Uh, now let, let me continue what I was talking about. Yes, we were talking about the photographs, the there autopsy photos. I took the photographs, okay, of, of the brain that are in the National Archives, all right? And so what we did is, we wondered why, why did, and so this is why we have a neurologist, Mike Chesser, on the program, because that's what he does all day, okay? He looks at x-rays and pictures of brains, okay? And so he, this is what he said. The upper range of a brain weight for a guy the size of John F. Kennedy which is about 6'1", 175, okay, would be around 1,380 to 1,400 grams. That's the top range of what it would be. Well, when they weighed the brain the day after the autopsy, it wasn't done that night, okay, it came in at 1,500 grams, which is more then the top range of a brain would be. Now, what makes that so odd, of course, is that anybody who's seen the Zabruder film will know that Kennedy got his head blown off. Yeah, most of his brain ended okay. up on the trunk of the car. Yeah, you see that whole stream of red and tissue going up, and then you see stuff going into the back, and then at Parkland Hospital, you see all this blood and tissue that's in the back of the car and Jackie Kennedy actually went out to the trunk of the car and retrieved part of his skull and she gave it to one of the doctors at Parkland. Can you imagine that? No, no. Holding your husband's brain in your hand. Unimaginable, unimaginable. Okay. And yet the brain weighed more after, afterwards than it should have. Well, now, now, how is that possible? Somebody that's else's brain. God's green earth. Is that possible? And so then we we went back and looked at some of the archival stuff, and we got Mike and Gary to talk about this. This doctor says, no, a large part of his brain was gone. This FBI agent says, no, there was about one quarter of his brain was. So in other words, who took those pictures? And so what we did, which should have been done a hell of a long time ago, we tried to find a suspect who actually did take those pictures, okay? And so what we centered on was a guy named Robert Newsom, who, and by the way, to show you how bad the Warren Commission was, you will not find Stringer's name 
in the Warren Report. And you won't find Robert Knudsen's name in the Warren Report either. Robert Knudsen, one of the most mysterious figures uh, in the JFK case, was not interviewed at all by the Warren Commission. But he was interviewed by the House Select Committee, but they didn't print his interview. And as Doug Horn says in the film, the reason they didn't print his interview, he thinks, is because everything he told them was contrary to what they printed. He says that he was called up the day of the assassination, and he was told to accompany Kennedy's body to the morgue at Bethesda. And he said he took some pictures. Okay. Then we have another witness who was at another place that was not the Secret Service Photo Center, Sandra Spencer, who said she saw these different pictures, okay, that are not, uh, you know, allowed for in the official collection. All right. So, see, this is one of the things we tried to do. We tried to pose questions that had not been posed before. And we can only pose these questions because of the ARB. The ARB declassified Newsom's testimony from the House Select Committee. The ARB brought in Stringer and confronted him with these pictures he says he doesn't remember taking. Okay? See that, so you th- you think Newtson took these photos? In public, my, my, our good sisters and brothers to the north. Okay, you know they they've never been exposed to this stuff. No, no. So this will be the first time, you know, that a broad audience is finally exposed to all these very real questions, which, in my opinion, you know, utterly decimates the Warren Commission report. And see, when I was writing it. This is one of the things I was my objective. I want to make this thing so full of new stuff, so full of genuine stuff, okay, that's backed up and that's solid, that any objective person, when confronted with this material, would have to say that the Warren Commission is worthless. That was my objective, okay, when I was writing it. All okay. right, Jim, I've got to take another quick time out. We'll come back and uh, discuss further. This is exciting stuff. JFK Revisited Through the Looking Glass, brand new documentary, just premiered in Cannes Film Festival. Jim D. Eugenio wrote the script. He's with us. Back with more of our conversation in mere moments. Stay with us. This is no place for the naive or the faint hearted. The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serra from Zoomer Radio. I don't need to tell you how important building and sustaining a healthy immune system is these days. And just in time, my good friends at Get The Tea are offering a special package called the Immune Builder. You get one month's supply of Life Change Super Tea. That's eight bags. One bottle of BioAstin. That's 75 capsules. Now, BioAstin or Astaxanthin is known as one of nature's most powerful antioxidants and provides a wide range of impressive health benefits. The Immune Builder also includes one bottle of potent C wild Alaskan sockeye omegas that's 90 gel caps and one copy of the book natural astaxanthin Hawaii's super nutrient by dr. William Sears there's so much more than tea at get the tea.com get your immune builder right now not available in any store use the code unlimited and all your purchases ship for free the immune builder from get the tea.com Passcodes, social insurance numbers. If they make you wonder how private they are, here's two more numbers. 416-360-0740 or toll free at 1-866-740-4740. If you study this operation, it has all the classic machinations of a black ops. That's all. You know, it's just basic exercise it's the way they do things in foreign countries and then they did them here if they brought some snipers in from uh, vietnam that would probably be the most likely scenario because they're good shooters 
and uh, they can be trusted. You don't want some crazy Cuban out there who has a right wing agenda shooting at them. You want to set them up. You want to bring Cubans in to scenery so you confuse people. Oswald is great scenery because what a story. Assassins who do these things for psychologically insane reasons, killing McKinley or killing uh, any of the, they always take credit for it. They're, They're proud, proud of it, of it usually. He, he said, I'm, he a said patsy. I'm a patsy. And, you know, and given what we know about his movements in the last few months, uh, it, it's, it's, you know, no one will go there. There you go. That's uh, Oliver Stone. I believe he was being interviewed by uh, David Talbot. You mentioned Talbot earlier from a salon. I'm thinking, you know, Jim, that uh, Oliver Stone probably wishes he he knew you and had you around when he was shooting the original JFK. There might there that film may have looked might have looked even more different. Like there may have been more things in there that he didn't know about. Right. Well, let's. I I actually think I could have helped him. Okay, you know, even back then when before the ARB, I think I could have helped him uh, because I knew a lot about the whole Garrison investigation at that time. Okay, which some people didn't know because that's what I was concentrating at at the time. So yes, and, and now he actually has my book in his office. You know, the JFK assassination, the evidence today. Right. He has about 10 copies, and he gives it to people when they come in. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yes, yes, I, I, I think so. In the, uh, in the documentary, now, I heard he's two- he's talking about Oswald. He's talking about Oswald right. there. Yes. We have some really, really interesting stuff on that side of it, okay? Um... John Newman knows a guy named Malcolm Blunt, who's one of the great researchers from the United Kingdom. And he got to know a guy named Tennant Bagley, okay, who used to work for the CIA. I think he worked for 23 years. And he worked uh, with James Angleton. He was the chief of station, I think, in Brussels, okay, and very, very familiar with how the CIA operates. And so, what we did is we took the, some of the documents that were coming in to the CIA about Oswald when he defected at the time of his defection. And it's a very, very, very odd routing system. They did not go to where they should go. They did not go to the Soviet Russia division. They went directly to the Office of Security, okay? And they stayed there. They stayed there. Even though, for example, the Navy Department was sending seven copies, they didn't get distributed to where they should have been distributed. So Malcolm got to know Bagley. And so one day they're having lunch. And he says, you know, I'd like you to look at this for me. Okay, since you've been in the CIA for so many years. And he said, and so he goes, what do you want me to look at? I want you to take a look at this routing system of these files that were coming in to the CIA. And he didn't say who it was. All right. And so he drew it. He drew it because they, they come into the mail. They don't go anywhere else. They only go to the office of security. And they stay there. They don't get distributed. So he draws this intake kind of intake map in front of him. And so Bagley looked at it for about a minute or so. And he turns to Malcolm and he says, all right, from this diagram, do you think this guy is witting or unwitting? And Malcolm said, well, how the heck do I know? And he goes, well, why don't you just take a guess? Do you think he's witting to what's going on or do you think he's unwitting? And Malcolm says, all right, unwitting. And Bagley came right back at him and said, no, this was a witting routed out plan in advance. And so for the first time that I know of, you actually have a CIA officer on the record as saying, that Oswald's defection was a plea 
pre-planned fake defection. I don't know any other CA officer who said that before. That's explosive. But we have that's it. Explosive. Okay. In, in in our film, and so that's what Oliver's talking about there. That you couldn't find a better guy. You really, could, you know, you know right. you, if you were dreaming up a scheme to kill Kennedy and pin it on a patsy, you couldn't find a better guy than Oswald. Well, let me ask you about something that happened in uh, and this. I think this came out uh, in, in 2017 when there was a bit of the, uh, the some of the files came out in 2017. And yeah. you were probably the one that that found this and brought it to my attention. But Richard Helm, CIA director at the time, um, in 75, he was asked a question about the possibility of Oswald being a CIA operative. And he, the, the, the first part of the question, you know, the question is in the record and then in the memo. And then the, but the answer just stopped short and we didn't, we don't hear the response from Helm. Do you remember that when that came out? Okay. The, all right. I, I know what you're talking about. And that is not what it was presented to be. Uh, that was continued, except they didn't have the continued page. Okay. Uh, but it was continued. And, and, and Helms, Helms did answer the question ah. in a negative way. Okay? okay. So that was kind of a false alarm. Okay. Now, but I will say this. In the longer version of the film, I know one thing I've talked to you about in the past is Mexico City. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. And that is going to be, in the long version of the film, that is going to be a very, very interesting subject. Okay. If you recall back in 2017, when this was making a hubbub because the everybody thought Trump was going to declassify the last of the documents, and then he backed out at the last minute. Okay. One of the things they were talking about was Mexico City, Oswald being in Mexico City. Well, we're going to argue that it's a very, very questionable call that Oswald was ever in Mexico City. Right. Okay. With some of the newest evidence that, that we have out there. And that again is foundational, like CE uh, 399. That's foundational, right? To the case. <laughs> this case, Richard, I'm sure you're aware of this. This case is made out of paper mache. Okay. You know, anywhere you stab at it, it gives way. Okay, I don't care what part of it is. It was all put together after the fact. Okay, so even the CIA plants inside the Cuban embassy, even they said, we never saw this guy. And so the CIA didn't want to take that. They didn't like that answer. So they went back and they asked him again, said, are you sure <laughs> that you never saw this guy? And he said, no. And they asked the other plant also, are you sure you never saw this guy? They were like begging him. Please say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, just about out of time here. We never saw this guy the whole time. We were here every day for eight hours a day. That's and we it. never saw this guy. Yeah, without okay. Mexico City and without CE 399, uh, as you say, it's uh, it's a house of cards. We're just about out of time, Jim. So are you saying right now that the film is intended for the European market only? We may not see it in North America? Well, right now it's, it's selling in the European market. We expect a UK sale very soon. As as far as I know, as it hasn't sold in, in North America yet, but they're working on that. See, I think the strategy was to have it make so much noise at Con, which Oliver did achieve. Yes. That he couldn't turn it down in the United States. And you, the and the four and you're screaming to see this movie. <laughs> right. And what about the four hour version? When might we wait? When might we see that? Now that? That one's that they're working on that one now. OK. And so if that doesn't get broadcast, OK, because it's too long then that will be on streaming. That will be available on streaming. Fantastic. All right. Well, Jim, again, congratulations. This is, uh, this is monumental. All the, all the work over the decades you've done, and it's now it's up there on the big screen. And uh, I think this is going to push the needle. How about you? Yes, I do think it's going to make a lot of noise. Okay. All right, but my friend. Richard, 
I yes. won't forget you. I'll still do your show. <laughs> That's okay. it. Don't go Hollywood on me now. Don't go Hollywood on me now, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> okay, partner. Congratulations. All right. All the best. James D. Eugenio, Kennedy's and King dot com. Kennedy's and King dot com. All right. When we come back, we're going to meet an old hippie from the 1960s. Traveled with the Merry Pranksters across the uh, the United States on that psychedelic bus further, met the Grateful Dead. And now and now he's singing the praises of something called structured water. We'll tell you all about it on the other side. Don't go away. Live from Toronto, Canada, Earth, The Conspiracy Show with Richard Sarratt on Zoomer Radio. Hey, thanks for inviting me into your home. Long haul truck, RV, camper, taxi, your parents' well-appointed basement with the simulated wood paneling, electric fireplace, and the painting of dogs playing poker. Your loft, that greasy spoon just off the interstate, and your cabin in the woods. Native American uh, artist uh, from, uh, well, in the San Francisco area, area during the 1960s, he flew a chopper in Vietnam. He owned uh, car lots in Nashville, had a publishing company in Nashville, lived next door to Johnny Cash. He's been in the advertising business and uh, lived in the Gulf Shores for 20 years, now selling something called a Kangen water machine, which produces structured water. And he's standing by from his home in Alabama, Mike Lancaster. Just a reminder before we get to Mike that I have a, a new show, The Richard Serrett Show, which airs weekday afternoons from 4 to 6 p.m. Eastern on Saga 960 a.m. Saga 960 a.m. Saga as in Mrs. Saga. And uh, you can listen to 960 a.m. across the GTA. If you can't pull it in on your radio, you can uh, you can stream it live on the website saga960am.ca. You can find it on a couple of uh, apps like Simple Radio and TuneIn, The Richard Serrett Show, weekdays, 4 to 6 p.m. Eastern on Saga 960 AM. Uh, it's it's like nothing I've ever done before, and I take no prisoners. All right. Uh, Mike Lancaster was barely a teenager when he hooked up with the famous Mary Prankster as a collection of comrades and followers of American author Ken Kesey back in 1964. Kesey and the Mary Pranksters lived communally at Kesey's homes in California and Oregon and are noted for the uh, the cultural impact um, of a lengthy road trip they took in the summer of 1964 traveling across the United States in a psychedelic paint, uh, painted bus called Further, organizing parties and giving out LSD. These days, Mike is spreading the word about the health benefits of structured water produced through Kangen machines. Mike Lancaster, welcome to the program. How are you? How are you doing, Richard? Uh, terrific. Thank you. I'm excited to talk to you because uh, you, you've had a remarkable, remarkable life, Michael. Let me just, we, we'll, we'll get around to talking about structured water because I'm very excited about that as well. But let, let, let's go back to 19, the early 1960s. How did you, as a, as a very young man, a teenager, barely a teenager, hook up with Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters? How did that happen? Well, I barely remember it myself. Uh, my uncle knew, uh, a guy by the name of Mike Hagen and Mike needed somebody to, um, run around on the bus with him to, uh, get all the wiring done and everything. He was doing the video of the uh, bus tour and my uncle volunteered me because he wanted to get rid of me <laughs> for the summer. Mm. And, uh, so I jumped on the bus and, um, um, went across country. I helped paint the bus and, and things like that. And, uh, I did, uh, all of the poster art for the, uh, acid tests and things like that. How so, old were you? How old were you? I was about 13, 12 or 13. Wow. When I was Holy old. smokes. You, you yeah, helped I paint that. Old. I was just, you know, like I said, I barely remember it. Do you remember anything about Ken Kesey? What was he like? 
Um, he was very astute, um, very well, well-spoken guy. Um, you know, he was a writer and it, and it showed. And did his, they take, did they take good care of you? I mean, you were just a kid. Did they, did they, you know, shield you from, you know, any of the excesses? Did they take good care of you? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. No, I was kind of on my own. Um, Mike kind of looked after me, Mike and, Hagen. Uh, yeah. but you know, I was, I was basically on my own. And, uh, did you meet the grateful dead? Uh, I was, uh, well, I had a Vespa. My uncle gave me a, a Vespa to run back and forth to school on. And, uh, I, my route went right by Jerry Garcia's house on hate street. And so after a few trips back and forth by their house, uh, they yelled over at me to come. They wanted to see the Vespa. And we got to talking, and uh, I started to hang out with them, and they gave me a, um, a room upstairs to do artwork in. And um, so I was basically hanging out with the uh, Grateful Dead at that wow. time. Holy and smokes. when when I was doing that, they weren't the Grateful Dead. They were they were the, the war Warlocks. Yeah, the Warlocks. And no, by and they were unknown. I mean, you know, they were just a bunch of kids, basically. Or they were they were older than I was, but but they were just out trying to, you know, make music and make a name for themselves. Are any there the uh, the Merry Pranksters? Are there? There's just a couple of them left, right? Yourself included. Yeah, there's not very many of us left, and um, I was—I uh, think I was born and I was born at the very right time because I got to enjoy the entire '60s and '70s, and and um, I can—I'm still living to tell about it. And uh, any memories from the uh, those uh, infamous or famous uh, Kool-Aid acid tests? <laughs> Well, one time the, um, yeah, we went, uh, when we, when we hooked up with, uh, Owsley. Owsley Stanley. Yeah. LSD. And we put the LSD in a, uh, a substance called MDA, which is, it will penetrate your skin. And what we did was we took like a gallon of it and we painted all the doorknobs on in city hall. And the, a lot of the cop car uh, door handles and things wow. like that. This is in San Francisco? In San Francisco, yeah. And that day, everybody was high. They oh, even bad. wrote about it in the newspaper. Well, LSD was okay. legal in California until about 1966, wasn't it? Uh, pardon? I think LSD was still legal in California up until, what, 1966 or something? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it became illegal October 10th of 66, I believe. But we were selling Owsley acid at the quick marts and things like that, you know, before it was made illegal. I mean, it was still legal. Right. And Owsley was like the, one of the number one producers. Uh, he was what mixing it up in his bathtub near Berkeley uh, yeah. and supplying like all the, all the musicians. Everybody knew Owsley Stanley. And he kind of bankrolled the, the Grateful Dead in the early days, didn't he? Yes, he did. He was he was their backer. Um, uh, Ken Kesey needed a band for the acid test, and I'm the one. I, I was one of them that introduced him to um, Jerry Garcia, and I put them together for the acid test. And then Owsley saw them at the uh, one of the acid tests and liked their style, like their sound. And so he decided to back them and become their sound guy. And he bought a lot of their expensive sound equipment. And um, so then once he bought the expensive sound equipment, when we would go to Golden State Park to do the weekend concerts and things like that with all the other bands, the other bands would try to steal the the sound equipment that Owsley bought and that's where the steal your face logo came from 
uh, we put the Steal Your Face logo on all of the sound equipment of the Grateful Dead. And then nobody could steal it. <laughs> and Stanley was uh, also sort of credited with kind of creating this wall of sound for the dead, right? All of these yeah. am- amplifiers stacked up. Right, right. Yeah, it was, it, that was really something to see. And what was Jerry Garcia and Bob Weir and, and, and Phil Lesh and, and the band, what were they like as, as people? Well, they were good guys. I mean, they, uh, they stayed high most of the time. <laughs> how did they play when they were in that state? How, how could they play that way? Well, they did. And uh, Jerry always played when he was high. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I was a little kid then, you know, and they were about 20, 25 years old when I knew them. And um, they they love my artwork. And um, that's why they, I think, like me, you know. So, but I mean, they were normal 20-year-old guys, you know. How did you survive on your own? Well, I wasn't really on my own. I, I lived with my uncle, and um, uh, and I was flying back and forth to uh, Indiana uh, also during during that time. And I, you never got, you never got into trouble. You never. I mean, did, I don't know if I can ask you this. I will though. I mean, when you when you were that when you were like thirteen, fourteen, did did you take acid? Yes. Yeah, I, uh, from uh, 1965 until 1967, I dropped acid literally almost every day. Wow. Which was absolutely acid. And when I met um, uh, Steve Gaskin, who uh, started the farm in Summertown, Tennessee, Stephen said, well, we all need to get off the acid because the marijuana is so powerful now, potent, if you can believe that. We don't need to take acid. So I went from acid to, to the marijuana. But when I got off the acid, uh, normal was was weird to me. Really? For the, yeah, for the first uh, month or so. I mean, I didn't see... Uh, buttons flying off of people's clothes and everybody had two eyeballs and things like that. (laughs) So it was kind of strange at that time. And do you ever wonder, do you ever think back, wow, I survived, I was lucky or was it, were you always sort of in control more or less? I was pretty much in control and I knew what the real bad things were and I stayed away from them. And, um, I pretty much looked out for myself. My grandparents taught me well. And um, uh, so, you know, I survived. I mean, you know, uh, it's amazing now that I'm, you know, I'm over 70 years old and people think I'm like 45 or 50. Yes, you are very youthful looking, I'll say. Yeah, I haven't aged aged like a lot of these guys have. You flew a chopper in Vietnam. Yeah. uh Any close calls? Uh, shot down seven times. Really? Yeah. How did you survive? Well, you you learn. You you just uh, you roll it in, and and um, I mean it's some hard landings, but I uh, had one close call with uh, the Viet Cong. They were uh, they almost captured me. Uh, that was a very close call. But um, thank God they they didn't get me. And and how long was your tour? Uh, 17 months. 17 months. Do you still fly a chopper? No. um, Quite frankly, I'm legally blind. Um, I'm blind in one eye and can't see out of the other one. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, this is the fire ants. This happened uh, with the fire ants. Yeah, Yeah, with fire ants. Uh Uh-huh. You stepped on a you stepped on a, a fire ant nest and uh, they stung you quite badly and it, it, it damaged your eyesight. Yeah, the poison did. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh I was gosh. hit by two or three thousand fire ants and uh, poison got went to my eyes. It's remarkable, right? You survived the '60s, uh, the LSD and the excesses of the '60s, 
you you uh, survived 17 months uh, on tour in Vietnam, shot down seven times by the Viet Cong, and what almost gets you? Fire ants. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right, so uh, you know we no. could spend we could spend a couple hours just talking about the Merry Pranksters and and your adventures, but let's talk a little bit about something called structured water. And um, what, what before before we get into you know the the, the Congan machines, what is meant by structured water? Structured water. Um, when you take when you when you have tap water, the tap water uh, number one uh, has all the bad chemicals in it. It's got the fluoride and chlor chlorine and things like that in it, which damages your body. And they have to do that in order to get the water alkaline enough to run through the pipes, or you will have another Flint, Michigan episode. Okay. It'll leach the lead out of the pipes. Yes. Yes. So the water has to come, so has to be alkaline. What is structured water? Structured water is water that in, in nature, it runs over the rocks in the mountains and the streams and the rocks will electrify the water somewhat which will eliminate a lot of the oxy oxidation in the water and it makes it uh, uh, more hydrogen it keeps the hydrogen in the water and so what they what they found is the people in the Himalayas uh, were drinking this water and they were living to be 120, 130, 100 and, uh, even 160 years old. And the guy found out about this. He went over to the Himalayas to study it. He worked for Sony over in Japan and he developed a machine that will mimic this water. And it takes most of the oxidation out. It's just like um, if you cut an apple open and let the apple sit out for a half an hour, what happens? It turns, it turns brown. brown. Right. And that's the oxidation in the air. Okay. It, it ages the apple. And what happens is when you drink the Cokes and when you drink the tap water or the even bottled water, it still has the oxidation in it, which will age your body and so you see a lot of people with a lot of wrinkles and things like that and that's what's happened they've they've been drinking and eating a lot of oxidation all their all their life so what we do is with the Congan machine the Congan will will make the water hydrogen and hydrogen is an antioxidant and so you drink the hydrogen water and the wa and the hydrogen will immediately absorb into your body's cells uh, a good example of this is if you take a normal water molecule okay let's say that that water let's 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 say the water molecule is uh, a tennis ball right and you're and your two little hydrogen units are, mar are little BBs, you know, attached to that big tennis ball. Right. Two hydrogen well, molecules, two hydrogen ball. atoms, and one and one oxygen atom. Right. And if you take the tennis ball and throw it against a chain link fence, it's not going to go through the chain link fence. But the okay? hydrogen will. But the two little hydrogen BBs go through the chain link fence. So what the machine does is it eliminates the tennis ball and just gives you the, all the little BBs basically in the water, which are, which are the hydrogen particles. And the hydrogen is what will absorb into your cells. You can take, we can take a, an athlete and have him drink 32 ounces of water and he will immediately be able to go and run a mile. I mean, it, there's no sloshing in his stomach or anything because his body has absorbed the water. 
So this Kongen machine, which was eventually, did you say, developed by Sony in Japan? Uh, an employee by Sony. Yeah. Ah. So how okay? How does it work then? It's 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 taking the water. It's running it over an electric electric uh, plate, right. uh, which is separating the the hydrogen and the oxygen. Yes. And. Yeah. So the the hydrogenated water then is produced, and there are varying levels, I understand, of the hydrogen uh, water. I mean, this Kangen machine isn't just turning out one kind of water, right? Right. It it makes seven different waters, and um, based on the pH level. Yes, your your pH it will make an eight point eight point five pH, a nine point zero pH, and a nine point five pH. And what do those numbers mean? Well, on your pH scale, you have 0 to 14, 7 being neutral. And your 7 uh, neutrality is pretty much what you're getting in your tap water. However, again, like I said, the tap water contains the chemicals to make it a 7, okay? The machine will produce, because of the hydrogen, will produce a higher pH. It will, you know, we, we try to start people out with on a, an 8.5 pH water. Then we graduate them up to a 9.0 and then finally a 9.5. And what happens is when you're drinking the 9.5, not only are you uh, going to feel better, but it will also take all of your supplements directly into your cells. If you just take supplements, which I know a lot of your listeners do, with just normal water, you're flushing 90% of those supplements down the toilet. But if you take the supplements with the 9.5 congen water, you are your body is retaining and absorbing 80% of those supplements. All right, Mike, we have to take a time out. We'll uh, come back and continue to discuss structured water. Mike Lancaster, artist, traveled with Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters in the 1960s, uh, helped paint the famous psychedelic bus that is so a uh, part of the, uh, the 1960s culture. And uh, we'll talk about the benefits of structured water and the Kangen machines back with more of our conversation right after this. Fasten your seatbelt and put your tray in the upright position. You're about to leave everything you know behind on The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett from Zoomer Radio. Here's a resolution for 2021. Reduce stress and enhance your immune system. ESS60 from C60 Evo. C60 is the carbon 60 molecule known to deliver more than 172 times the power of vitamin C, 172 times. ESS60 is the purest form of C60, a known antiviral, antibacterial, and anti-inflammatory remedy that works. ESS60 neutralizes free radicals from cell metabolization and external toxins to help minimize inflammation and maximize detoxification. Further, people report better sleep, more energy, and renewed mental clarity when they take our ESS60 organic oil. To order your miracle molecule ESS60, go to c60evo.com slash Richard hyphen Serrett. c60evo.com slash Richard hyphen Serrett. Buy now and save 10% by using the coupon code EVRS at checkout. Again, use the coupon code E V R S at checkout. Providing the evidence and letting you draw your own conclusions. This is The Conspiracy Show with Richard Sarrett on Zoomer Radio. And we are back with Mike Lancaster, former member of the Merry Pranksters, uh, artist hung out with the Grateful Dead when he was just a kid. 
and now he's um, singing the praises of structured water. This is um, a machine that utilizes uh, electrolysis and uh, will produce different pH levels of water. It hydrogenates the water, and that's what your body needs, apparently. It needs this um, hydrogenated water. Your cells absorb the water uh, better when there are more hydrogen atoms in the water. So the Kangen machine, what does it look like exactly, and how does it work? Well, the, it's, uh, the machine itself is about, uh, oh, I don't know, a foot and a half high by six inches by uh, a foot, something like that. I mean, I carry it in my backpack when I travel uh, around the world. I take the machine with me every place. And um, the reason I'm so into the water is I had a partner here in Gulf Shores by the name of Bill Mitchell. And he and I, uh, we did parasailing together and, and jet ski rentals and things like that. Well, he retired and he got into the Congan business. And he come over one day and I was eating some strawberries. And he said, well, let me wash your strawberries for you. I said, well, I've already washed them. And he said, well, let me wash them with the Congan water. So he washed the strawberries with the Congan water. And it's amazing what came off of it. I mean, there's a video on the website. Yeah, I've seen uh, it. The water is uh, practically black. It's Yeah. And he said that's all the pesticides that was on the strawberries because the Congan water, there's a, a Congan water uh, 11.5 that will solidify oil and all of your pesticides are oil based because of the rain you know they don't they won't don't want to spray them on the vegetables and then have the rain come around and take it off so they use a, an oil base uh, uh, pesticide and so after i saw that i said well i'm never going to eat another strawberry until i get a machine so i got a machine i uh, started on the water and all through my life, I've had three blown discs in my back, very bad. And uh, at times, there were I would I would get so bad in my back that I couldn't walk. So I got on the water, and I have not, I have never had another back problem since. Went to the chiropractor; he looked at me and uh, x-rayed me, and he couldn't believe it. Uh, he said, I want you to order me a machine immediately for his clients. And um, and there's just story after story after story, but that's my story. And uh, I, could, I could stay 12 hours on here and, and tell you about all the things that this water has right. so done for people. And, the Kangen uh, machine uh, produces these different different types of water. So the 11.5 pH you use to wash fruits and vegetables, and it takes the pesticides off of them. Right. And and then the the optimal sort of water for drinking is 9.5. Yes. Then there's an there. Well, how many different types of water does it does it produce? Well, it has a a 6.0 pH for beauty water because that's what your skin is. Is six is a 6.0 pH, and it it keeps your your hair its normal color, and it keeps your skin looking good. It eliminates the wrinkles and things like that, or it helps. And then it has the 2.5 hypochlorous acid water, and that's what the hospitals use to disinfect. The 2.5 hypochlorous acid water that the machine produces uh, will kill all your viruses, including MRSA. Uh, we use that for uh, this uh, China virus thing to, to, instead of buying hand sanitizer, you just spray your hands with the 2.5 and and it's you're good to go. What happens if you drink the 2.5? Is there any danger? No, no. there isn't. And, um, so in, in other words, so, it doesn't taste, it doesn't taste any different. It just has a different pH level. Yes. Uh huh. Exactly. So you drink the 9.5, you wash your fruits and vegetables with the 11.5, you wash your, your face and your hair, uh, with the six, 
And then if you want to, if you want to disinfect, you use the 2.5. Right. Mm -hmm. So you're and making up, you're making up bottles of water. Uh, I mean, you can eliminate all of the chemicals in your house with this machine. So what do you do? Do you make a bunch in advance? Do you make, okay, so here's my batch of 2.5. I'm going to use that. I'm put that aside. I'm going to use that to wash my hands. Uh, uh, do you, and then you make a batch of um, the 9.5 just for drinking water. You keep in the fridge. How long, if you make it ahead of time, how long does it maintain the pH level? The 9, it'll always maintain the pH level. Uh, it's your hydrogen that will escape. And your hydrogen will stay in the water approximately 24 hours, 24 to 48 hours. So if you uh, get a water bottle full of, of water to take with you, you're good to go for the day um, and even for the next day. You know, it's, it's still going to have a little hydrogen left in it. But the, the water, uh, especially with the China virus, um, I, I have had probably a hundred friends that got the China virus last year. And I would just simply walk right into their, into their house. I wasn't scared of it at all. Uh, put them on the water and zinc and the water, see, will take the zinc directly to their cells. And after the first glass of water and zinc pill, they felt a hundred percent better. And within 24 hours, they were out walking around and and having a good time. So, how much how much water can a, a, a this little Kangen machine make in? I don't know how long does it take, for example, to churn out a gallon of water if you want to drink the 9.5? Uh, uh, about two minutes. Two minutes. Yeah. And how many of these? Because it works through electrolysis, right? How many of these? What are they, silver uh, plates uh, in, uh, inside the machine? They are platinum plates, and that's why they're expensive, made from platinum. And um, there are several different types of machines. Uh, they have a machine just for a married couple, and that has four plates in it. Uh, then they have two other machines. One has seven plates, and the other one has eight plates. And... Um, if you're wanting to give the water away to people, they need to get one of the bigger machines, one of the more, you know, the, the machines are all the same size, but I mean, the, it's uh, the plates. They need, they need a machine that either has seven or eight plates in it. Now, these were developed in Japan. Do they, do they have them in the hospitals in Japan? Yes, they have, the, have them in the hospitals worldwide except for the United States, and FDA has not approved them yet as a medical device. Um, but uh, a lot of, you have a lot of your entertainers here in, in this country using the water. I mean, you know, Betty White, you know, she's 100 years old. Yes. Thank you to Congan Water. Oh, is that what she attributes it, it to, the, the drinking the Kangen yeah. water? Yeah. Uh, Donald Trump has five machines. And if you noticed, when he got the China virus, he was over it in 24 hours. I mean, it was no big deal. Uh, Bill Gates has 12 machines in his house. Uh, Willie Nelson, another one who is, I think, about 90 years old. He's, He's getting up there. Yeah, I mean, they're and you, they're all attributed to to the Congan water, and uh, it's just something that people don't talk about. It's just something that uh, it's a kind of a secret. That... And a Congan is spelled K A N G E N K A N G E N. That's a Japanese word. What does it mean? Do you know? Uh, back to uh, back to nature. Back to nature. We should point out the website. If they go to my website, strangeplanet.ca, strangeplanet.ca, and just scroll down and find your name under tonight's show, just click on Mike Lancaster, and that'll take you to the website, which is named after the bus, of course, onfurther.com, onfurther.com, and further is spelled F-U-R-T-H-U-R, 
F U R T H U R dot com on further dot com. And uh, you mentioned a couple of the, the videos there. Um, we're we're going to take a quick time out here. When we come back, I want to talk to you about one of the videos on the website. This uh, young man uh, did kind of an experiment using his microscope showing how Kangen water helps your blood. We'll uh, we'll discuss that on the other side. Mike Lancaster, my guest, st- uh, talking about structured water and the Kangen machines. Back with more in a moment. Stay with us. The owners of the system are asleep. Now we can play The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serra from Zoomer Radio. Introducing Hey there, I'm hard at work on another edition of Inner Sanctum, my free monthly newsletter. Inner Sanctum features my monthly brief, a column of my thoughts and opinions on what's happening in the world. It features a spotlight on a past guest, a look ahead to an upcoming episode of my weekly syndicated radio program, The Conspiracy Show. It features a look at this month in conspiracy and UFO history and my Conspiracy Unlimited podcast episode pick of the month and so much more. To get your free monthly newsletter, Inner Sanctum, delivered to your email inbox, just go to my website, strangeplanet.ca, strangeplanet.ca. Scroll down to the bottom of the page and click on on Inner Sanctum and register. It's fast, easy, and again, absolutely free. Take a look around. What do you really see? This is where you can tell all about it. The Conspiracy Show with Richard Sarrett on Zoomer Radio. Mike Lancaster has had a remarkable life. Helicopter pilot in Vietnam, traveled the country with Ken Kesey and the Merry Pranksters. He's an artist. He's sold used cars. He lived next door to Johnny Cash very quickly. Did you ever meet Johnny Cash? Oh, yeah. We used to run around together all the time. Uh, was this in his in his hell-raising days or after he found uh, God? After he found God. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got to meet Billy Graham when he stayed at the house and things like that. Remarkable, remarkable. So, uh, we were talking about the Kangen machines, and I, um, I I mentioned this video that's on the website on further.com. Again, further, F U R T H U R. And uh, it's. Oh, you can spell it either way. Yeah. Uh huh. All right. That's smart because people are probably going to spell it the other way on further.com. So there's a, a video of this young man um, has a microscope, and he's looking at your blood. Uh, or his own blood, actually. He pricks his finger, puts his blood on a slide after he drinks normal tap water, and then he does it after he drinks coffee, and then finally, after he drinks the Kangen water. Just kind of walk us through what happens to the blood. What do we see in that in that through that microscope? Well, that's after, right after he got up out of bed in the morning, and uh, when he drank coffee, the the blood became. Uh, uh, a little active, not much, but a little. Uh, he drank the bottled water, and uh, that didn't do very much for his blood at all. It was still uh, basically uh, the cells were all uh, still together. Things like you know they're stuck together. Right, because uh, when when the healthy blood cells, when you look at under at a microscope, you should see lots of individual little little blood cells, like millions of blood cells, and they should be kind of moving and bouncing around. Right. Uh, so when you wake up in the morning, your blood is not moving around and the and the, and the the cells are not kind of differentiated. You don't, you just kind right. of see one big glob. Then under right. the, with the coffee, you start to see, because of the caffeine, the blood cells kind of start to move around a little bit. You start to see little individual cells, not a lot, but then what happens with the, uh, the, Kangen, the Kangen water? When he drank the Kangen water, they all separated and they were just going crazy, like they're supposed to. Right, right. Delivering oxygen to the different parts of your body. We've so, even uh, we've we've even had uh, one guy that that was going through a heart attack, and he started drinking the Kangen water, and he snapped right out of it. In the midst of a of a cardiac episode. Yeah. Uh huh. Right back to normal. 
So uh, we were talking earlier about how you were stung by thousands of fire ants, and you woke up the next day. You were completely blind, right? Yes. Uh huh. Has the do you think that the Kangan water has because I mean, where you're still legally blind, but where is your eyesight now compared to when it was that fateful morning you woke up and you were blind? Well, in my good eye, I am uh, about uh, twenty forty. I mean, I can drive a car, and um, you know, some days it improves, other days it it goes back down a little bit, but. Uh, I have not had any any um, setbacks on it at all since I've been drinking the water. So you attribute the Kangen water to to helping to help restore your eyesight. Yes. Yes. Uh, before I got on Kangen water, I was on blood pressure meds, and I haven't taken blood pressure meds for almost a year. Remarkable. Totally normal. And um, CBD oil, um, what you, you say that it's uh, the, the Kangen water with the CBD oil is kind of the perfect combination. What do you mean? Well, it's and and this works with all herbs or any supplement anybody takes. But the but the CBD is a is just proof of point. We have a lot of CBD stores that give out the water to their customers. Uh, to take with the CBD, you know, we, you'll and and when we're in a CBD store, you a lot of times you'll have a customer that come in and he spent a hundred dollars on a little bottle of, of CBD and it doesn't help him, you know, and uh, they say, oh, my back still hurts, the CBD doesn't work, and da 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 da. Well, we if we're in there, we'll say, well, wait a minute, you know, come on back with us to this water machine and take your normal dose of CBD. Okay, they'll take their normal dose of CBD, and then we'll have them drink 16 ounces of Kangen water. Within two minutes, their back is is quit hurting. And I mean, they just everybody has just kind of a a, a crazy stare in their face, and they'll, they'll just say, "My God, what is going on? I feel great." You know, I mean, this is just crazy. And but what happens is that the hydrogen in the water again takes the CBD directly to their cells, and the CBD does its thing, takes the pain away. Do you use the, the Kangen water to make your morning coffee? Reaction. Okay. I don't know if you drink coffee, but do you use the Kangen water to make your coffee? Yes. Yes. And the Kangen water will make your coffee about a 6.9 to a 7.1 on the pH scale. So it's it's less acidic then because coffee is very acidic. So if you enjoy your coffee, you're going to make it less acidic with the 9.5 Kangen water. Exactly. And exactly. do you use it? Do you use it to to, uh, to do all your cooking as well? If you're going to yes. boil eggs, for example, maybe you want a hard boiled egg for breakfast. Do you you boil it in the Kangen water? Yes. Yeah, we use the Kangen machine. We use the Kangen machine more than we will open the refrigerator. You know, it is, the Kangen appliance is the most used appliance in the kitchen. So do you ever turn your tap on uh, other than to fill up the, uh, so you put the, the tap water into the Kangen machine? Is that the idea? No, the tap water goes directly into the Kangen machine. Right, okay. So you can, you can uh, turn a valve and, uh, and get just tap water. And does it filter out the chemicals as well? Yes immediately filters out the chemicals and then it transfers it from the filters to the uh, electrolysis. Can it filter out fluoride though? It takes out the fluoride. Wow. All right. Listen, Mike, we've got to take one final time out. We'll come back and uh, we'll talk about how people can get a Kangen machine. Mike Lancaster, artist and uh, traveled with Ken Kesey across the United States back in 1964 on that famous psychedelic bus further. He helped paint that bus. And now he's here telling us all about structured water. Back with more of The Conspiracy Show right after this. Don't go away. In a democracy, we elect officials so we can sleep at night. So why are you up? 416-360-0740 or toll free at 1-866-740-4740. As if the William... 
I don't need to tell you how important building and sustaining a healthy immune system is these days. And just in time, my good friends at Get The Tea are offering a special package called the Immune Builder. You get one month supply of Life Change Super Tea. That's eight bags. One bottle of BioAstin. That's 75 capsules. Now, BioAstin or Astaxanthin is known as one of nature's most powerful antioxidants and provides a wide range of impressive health benefits. The Immune Builder also includes one bottle of Potent C Wild Alaskan Sockeye Omegas. That's 90 gel caps. And one copy of the book, Natural Astaxanthin, Hawaii's Super Nutrient by Dr. William Sears. There's so much more than tea at getthetea.com. Get your immune builder right now. Not available in any store. Use the code UNLIMITED and all your purchases ship for free. The Immune Builder from getthetea.com. Listening to The Conspiracy Show with Richard Serrett from Zoomer Radio. All right, Mike, let's uh, let's get right to the uh, the essential question here. <laughs> how, how, how much would one of these Kangen machines? Uh, and again, these are used in hospitals all over the world. But if I wanted one in my own kitchen, how how much is that going to set me back? Well, it just depends on what on how you're using the water. Uh, you can get a machine for around 2500 uh, The best machine that we have is about uh, 4900 And uh, you, you can finance it with no money down. Um, you know, I mean, if, you, if you're thinking about your health, that's, that's what you do. You know, it's just like a guy down here said, well, you know, there's no way I'm going to buy a water machine. And he and he turned right around and bought an eighty thousand dollar pickup truck, a toy. And about six months later, he got sick because he didn't have the water, and now he can't drive his truck. So top the top of the line machine is about forty nine hundred U.S. Yes. Uh huh. And how long will they last? Uh, they last, uh, we say, twenty five to thirty years. Uh, I bought a. Um, uh, I had a guy that uh, was going into a, an old folks' home, so he couldn't take his machine with him. And he had one that he had used for 12 years. And I got it from him, and uh, we tested the machine out. He had never cleaned it or anything. And the machine was actually better than a new one. And how do you say, when you, when you say better, how do you mean? Uh, it had a, a better ORP on it, which what is a... Uh, your hydrogen, it it produced more hydrogen. Your your ORP is um, it measures your hydrogen in the water, which is your antioxidants. Right. And we say that drinking one sixteen ounce glass of Congan water is the equivalent of eating five pounds of blueberries. Really? Yeah. Is that backed up by any sort of data? I mean, how do we know that? That's minus two hundred, and that's freshly picked blueberries. Right. Uh, the Congan water has an ORP of about a negative eight hundred and fifty. Ah, okay, I see. And if how do you properly service it? Do you have to have it cleaned every year? Because you know the water. If you live in a place where there are a lot of minerals in the water, it'll, it'll like you look at the bottom of your tea kettle, for example, after a couple of years. It's just it's cal, uh, you know you calcium every three or four months it depends on on how much you use it and uh, it's very easy to do it takes you a couple of hours you just put some um, uh, citrus uh, uh, powder in it and the citrus will eat the calcium off and uh, in the morning you get up and rinse it out and it's ready to go all right so how do we i mean where do you buy them well, they need to go to onfurther.com, and um, if they're serious about it, uh, uh, you know we can we can sell them one right over the phone. You can't buy ship, them online. You, you can't buy, buy them online. No, you cannot buy them online. Okay, so you order by phone, and they ship. Do they ship? Do you ship everywhere? Yeah, we ship worldwide. Uh, the company has twenty, I think, twenty-six offices worldwide. And uh, 
There's one in Toronto, actually. Oh, that's right. You sent me the address. It's in uh, it's in New- North York, actually. Uh, the the um, Leslie Shepherd area, roughly, for those listening who know the area. So, uh, forty nine hundred for the top of the line. What are the what are the lesser expensive ones worth? Uh, you have the five or the uh, seven plate machine uh, that runs thirty nine, and then you have the four plate machine which runs about twenty eight hundred. So I see that what's making it more expensive the number of plates because they're made out of platinum. Yeah, it's the number of the plates. Uh huh. Exactly. The more plates, the more hydrogen that you get. All water. right. So. So again, it's uh, onfurther.com, onfurther.com, and you can order your, your Kangen machine right over the phone. Um, we just have a few minutes uh, left. I wanted to ask you about this uh, fellow I, I recently heard about, Don Skeeter Davis. He's um, he's 75 years old, and you know he was a, a, a hippie like yourself, and back in the 1971, like 50 years ago, he took his last acid trip, and then recently, um somehow 50 Mm -hmm. years after his last acid trip he he um he had another one even though he hadn't been taking he hadn't been taking lsd how did that happen that happened to me and it happened to me last summer um i was uh in northern alabama on a farm and uh we had to walk about a half a mile uh, to the end of the property. So before I went, I drank a huge glass of Congan water and uh, walked. And once I got to about, a, you know, to the end of the property, I started to trip. And what happened was that the Congan water cleansed my cells out so much from sweating and and you know all the exercise and things that I actually went on another LSD trip. And when was the last time you'd taken LSD? Uh, 67. In 1967? Yeah. Oh my Lord. So this Skeeter Davis fellow, who's 75, dropped acid the last time in 1971, and then he starts drinking the Kangen water because he's got arthritis. Right. And that caused him to go on a 12 hour trip, acid trip. Mine was 12 hours as well. Was it unpleasant? No, uh-uh. no, I, I saw, uh, I saw Oscar, my pink elephant that I always talk to. <laughs> <laughs> you reunited with Oscar, did you? Yeah. So yeah, it was, um, it, it was okay, but, but yeah, that's what Congan water can do. And, um, uh, I mean, we can, I can tell you story after story after story about Congan water. Well, we've got a few minutes. Share another one with us. Uh, we had a guy here. They had a CBD store here locally here in Gulf Shores. He ordered two machines for his stores. And so we kept taking him water in bottles. And what happened was he kept drinking the water and he was scheduled for knee surgery. And uh, about two weeks Later, he forgot something in the house. He went into the house to to get whatever he forgot, and he ran back out to his truck, which he hasn't been able to run for years. Got in the truck, and uh, his wife said, "You do you realize that you just ran?" And he said, "It's that water." <laughs> He right. said, I cannot believe it. It's the water. He said, I'm going to cancel my um, my knee surgery. So so that's one part of it. Now his machine came. He hooked his machine up and started drinking the water directly from the machine. Okay, now he's getting a lot more hydrogen than what he was getting from us. And that hydrogen or that water put him in bed for two days because he was detoxing so badly. Oh, is that what happens? You detox, and what happens? You just feel fatigued. Yeah, yeah. The yeah, the 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 hydrogen goes into your cells, and your cells your cells basically pulsate. And when the hydrogen gets into the cells, it pushes all the 
all the bad stuff out of your cells, and that's you will you'll start to to detox. All right. So again, uh, the Kangen machine available on. Uh... Well, you have to order it uh, by phone, but you go to onfurther.com, onfurther.com, and your phone number is right there on the website, Mike, or do they email you? Yep. Onfurther.com. Yeah, right. they need to go to the website and look at a couple of the videos on there and um, learn a little bit about it. It's uh, We don't just sell machines to people. We help people and, you know, we stay with them, you know, forever if we have to to get them over whatever they've got or to help them with the machine. And uh, that little machine just sits right on top of your kitchen counter, doesn't take up much space. About the size of what, a toaster? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, All sure right. is. All right, the Congan machine for a structured water on further.com, on further.com. Mike, a great, uh, great pleasure meeting you. you uh, you've had a, a fascinating life and I hope we can talk some more sometime. Nice talking to you, Richard. All right, Mike Lancaster. All right, that's it for me. Back next week with a brand new live show. Hope you'll be along for the ride. My thanks to Carlos and Ryan. In the meantime, don't be afraid. There's nothing concealed that won't be revealed and nothing hidden that won't be made known. What you hear in the dark, speak in the light. What I say in a whisper, proclaim from the housetops. Move over, Aphrodite, I'm coming home. <laughs>